So the reform package has been met with quite a lot of opposition from lawyers. The criminal defence advocate Edith Forrest joined us in the studio in discussion with Sandy Brindley, who is the chief executive of Rape Crisis Scotland. So, Edith, we've currently got three verdicts in Scots law, guilty, not guilty and not proven. Um, as a lawyer, can you just explain to us what no, not proven actually means? Yes, of course. So, not proven is a verdict of acquittal. So, um, essentially what juries are told by the judge at the end of the trial. And in fact, now at the start of the trial as well, sometimes touching it, but they're directed that um, they have to reach a verdict on each charge on the indictment and they have to return a verdict of either guilty, not guilty or not proven. In terms of guilty and, uh, not guilty, not proven, they're both um, verdicts of acquittal. So if that person, if, if they return a verdict of one of those two, that person then is acquitted of the charge and uh, other than in certain circumstances cannot be tried again on that charge. So what do you think about the idea of getting rid of not proven? I'm against it uh, and in a way proven and not proven would be the more obvious uh, verdicts rather than guilty, not guilty, because what a jury is told is that they have to decide if the Crown have proved a case to the standard required. So the Crown have to prove um, each charge um, by corroborated evidence that's cre both credible and reliable uh, and beyond a reasonable doubt. And it's only if the Crown have proved that that the, the jury can convict. So. Um, and I certainly, sometimes a judge will say that uh, to a jury, sometimes a jury will come mm. back with a question once they've gone out to consider the verdict and they'll come back and ask, what's the difference between not proven, not guilty? And the judge would always just reiterate what they've said already, but there is no difference. Okay. Sometimes it's maybe just a different emphasis on what the jury want to, to convict of. But they're both acquittals. They're both acquittals. Yes. Okay. So, Sandy, what do you make of the, uh, this, um, the proposal to get rid of not proven? Now, I think it's clear from Edith's explanation there that there is no clear difference between not proven and not guilty, but also it's really confusing for, for juries. That's what the research, the mock jury research that was carried out in, in Scotland found, that there's no direction for juries, but when should you use not proven or not guilty? Because they both mean the, the, the exact same thing in terms of consequences. I think it's confusing, I think it's an anomaly, and I think it's used disproportionately in rape cases and I, I do think there's a real worry that juries hide behind it and this pa potentially contributes at least in part to the, the low conviction rate we have for rape in Scotland. What do you make of that? Do juries hide behind it and they find it confusing? Absolutely not. I do, in practice that is not correct. Sometimes as I say juries come back and say what's the difference but by that point they've clearly made a decision that the standard required to be met by the Crown has not been met. So um, it, it's, not, it's not in any way confusing, it's very clear it's a, it's a, it's a verdict of acquittal um, and whilst it may be used uh, in, in sexual offences I can't see abolishing it is going to result in juries suddenly convicting people. They've obviously made a decision that they've to be acquitted and, and the distinction is perhaps just on emphasis uh, as we see. I mean, Sandy, Edith doesn't think it would um, increase the number of convictions if you got rid of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I would like to say I don't really understand what, what that means to say it's a question of emphasis. Now, I, I don't think juries or the general public would understand what, what that means. And in, in terms of convictions, I, I do agree with Edith. I, I don't think it would have a huge impact, uh, convictions. But I, I, I have seen a, a number of not proven verdicts in cases that just seems astonishing to me in terms of the weight of evidence that there, there was, including sometimes evidence of really significant physical injury. So I, I think there may be the, the odd case that would result in an, an maybe a guilty rather than a not proven. But in general, I don't think this is about improving convictions. I think it's about having a clearer justice system. And certainly the, the, the research that was carried out by Professors James Chalmers, Fiona Leverick um, and Vanessa Monroe, the mock jury study, one of the largest of its kind, found that this verdict was indeed confusing for jurors. Um, let's move on to um, what's being discussed about juries. At the same time, scrapping, they're not proven. They want to reduce the number of juries from 15 to 12, but introduce a two-thirds majority for a guilty verdict. W what do you make of that, Edith? Well, to begin with, I'm, I'm not sure where those numbers have come from. I don't, I don't know why that those particular numbers have come about. Obviously, in England and Wales, you have juries of 12, but my understanding is that they would require a 
a majority of, of 10 to 2. And I think during discussions about this, there was that number. So I don't, I don't know why it stayed at 8 to 4. Um, so I'm, I'm not clear on where that's come from. Well, what, would, what would the benefit be, do you think? I'm, I'm really not, I'm not sure, um, mm -hmm. to be honest. I, I, I don't know where that, that number has been formulated from. Sandy, what, what do you make of this idea of, of reducing the number of jurors? Would you welcome that? I, mean, I, I, I don't really understand the rationale for it. it my, my concern around that is we, we know that, that juries can be particularly reluctant to convict in rape cases, and I, I think a change in the majority could actually lead to less convictions. And the, the net result of this bill that's intended to improve legal responses to rape, because of this particular part, I think means that the bill overall could lead to less rape convictions. And g given how low the convictions are just now, I, I really think that would be a grave concern. You think the overall package will lead to less uh, rape convictions, Sandy? I think it could. I mean, it, it, this is not to be in any way negative about the bill. I think it is a landmark bill. I think it's groundbreaking. It could dramatically improve people's experience of the system. But I think there is a difference between procedural justice, which mo most of this bill will improve people's experience of the system. But pe people report rape also because they want to see justice at the end of it. And it's that part in terms of the ability to get justice and a, a, an outcome that is, is validating for people that I think is in question because of this potential change to the jury majority. What would you make of that, Edith? I must say, I struggle with this notion that the conviction rate's too low. I, I, I don't know where that comes from. And I also am concerned that that's the basis upon which a bill has been drafted to up a conviction rate. Um, so I struggle with that. I also struggle... So you don't think the conviction rate is too low? I don't see any evidence of that. And certainly working in the courts day in, day out, seeing the cases from beginning to end. So, for example, Rona, you couldn't pop along to the High Court and sit through an entire rape trial. You wouldn't get to sit through the evidence of a complainer because it's a closed court to, to allow them to give their evidence. Or very often it's been pre-recorded, but even if it is pre-recorded, you still can't sit through that. So you can't see the, the case. So someone like myself who's dealing with these cases day in, day out, and I can't think of a single case where I've thought a jury have got it completely wrong. Some cases, um, particularly rape cases, where it really just comes down to two people's words against the other, you can see, you know, I might think, you know, it's 50-50 and it might go against my client and I can be disappointed, but I can still see why a jury's come to that decision. So the other thing I'd, I'd like to say is that the research that's been done in Scotland by uh, Professor Chalmers and uh, Fiona Leverick, government funded, using mock juries, there has been other research done by a professor, Cheryl Thomas, in England, which looks at England, Wales and Northern Ireland, where it actually shows mm -hmm. the conviction rates over a period of 15 years using about 70,000 juries. The conviction rate has gone up, so uh, I can only imagine that's reflected in Scotland as well. Well, well let's get Sandy in on that then. You think it uh, isn't high enough, obviously. <laughs> Well, the, the, the conviction rate, I mean, Cheryl Thomas's research that's referred to there d does not um, cover Scotland. So I think we need to look at what is the position in Scotland. And in Scotland, the conviction rate is 51%. The overall conviction rate for crime is 90%. So it is significantly lower. And it is simply incorrect to say that there's any rape cases happening in the High Court where the only evidence is the testimony of the complainer and the testimony of the accused, if they choose to give evidence, which they, they, they may not. We've got a requirement for corroboration in Scotland. A case simply would not get to court if the only evidence was the complainer's testimony. Um, just a quick question at the end. Um, what do you think, Sandy, about the pilot with the judge-only uh, rape trials? Well, that, that, this is a recommendation from Lady Doreen, the second most senior judge in Scotland, and it's based on significant international evidence um, demonstrating concerns about the impact of rape myths and attitudes of jury members on decision making. Uh, I think we want a system based on a fair and objective assessment of the evidence. So you don't think jurors are fair and objective? No, not, not in rape cases, in, in every case. We, we, we have been contacted by a number of people that have sat in rape juries to, anonymously to say, I need to tell somebody how awful it was, the attitudes that were being expressed in those deliberations. What would you think about uh, jurors not being in the rape trials? I think it's hugely insulting to the general public who are basically been told we can trust you with a, a murder trial but you're not to be trusted with a, a sexual offence. 
Uh, we're, we are told, and the, the appeal court regularly tells us as lawyers, that the juries are to be trusted. And, and that's certainly my experience. And it's part of somebody's civic duty to, to come and sit in a, as a juror. And they're asked, and I frequently say in my jury speeches, you're, you're asked to come here with your life experience, with you know, um, your knowledge of life, apply that to this case. And juries mm -hmm. range from an age and, and all sort of social um, diversities and all sort of different diverse um, aspects of life. And they bring that to bear upon a, a, a trial. So these jury myths, they don't, I don't see them. And again, Professor Thomas has, has looked at these and said they, there are no jury myths either. So I think okay. it's a myth to say there's a jury myth. Okay, we will have to leave it there. But thank you both very much indeed for joining thank us this you. evening. Thank you.